My name is Leonidas Poulopoulos. I'm chairing this session, uh, which is entitled Network Monitoring. We have three very interesting presentations. Uh, we begin straight away with uh, Lars Landmark. Lars is a postdoc at the FFI in collaboration with the University Graduate Center at Heller, right? And uh, UNINED. And he's going to give a presentation about uh, measuring pocket forwarding behavior in a production network where he's going to present his research where he found out some very interesting thing about those black boxes which we call routers. So the stage is yours. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. He's on. Okay. Do you hear me now? Okay, my name is Lars Lamarck, and I'm going to present uh, uh, measure, well, I'm going to present uh, some testbed that we have done, uh, measuring packet forwarding behavior in a production network. I guess all of you have done some uh, measurements, either by ping, trace route, or you have some traffic into a network in order to find out uh, the throughput. You have also probably uh, look at uh, the results in terms of statistics, and you have a look at uh, the measurements. You're using probably use standardized method, and you have a look at results, and you see that the results is correlated to the to the hypothesis you had in front. This was not the case in our case. We started by a hypothesis saying that well, multicast multicast traffic will require a longer uh, forwarding time within the routers. That was what we started. So we started by sending traffic into the network, and now I'm going to see what happens. <coughs> so first we're going to say some few words about traffic measurements in general. Then we're going to look into the timers, and static timers versus uh, variable timers. And then we're going to look into those black boxes, which is called routers and switches, and see how packets are actually being forwarded within those uh, black boxes. Then we're going to look at um, our measurement path and the results, and the end, the conclusion. So, you have probably done some uh, measurements. You have done uh, some uh, measurements to detect the uh, bottleneck using packet dispersion technique. You have probably done some end-to-end -end delay using time, well, by setting timestamp at the source and at the destination, and then you find out the end-to-end uh, end -end delay. And you have some done some jitter, perhaps, and then you have collected uh, some information about uh, the traffic path by using trace route. Those are ordinary, well-known methods. When it comes to the end-to-end -end delay, there are some timers involved. Uh, those are well known. It is the transmission time, which is the reply time to serialize all bits of a packet on the cable. <coughs> it is the propagation delay. That is the time for transmitting a bit over, uh, over the transmission line. The propagation the velocity over an optical fiber is uh, two-thirds of the speed of light, so it's pretty fast. And then it's the processing processing time, it is required time for a router to transmit a packet from the incoming interface and to the outgoing interface. The processing time is within the router or the black boxes. So when a packet arrives to the, at the inline card, it's being, being uh, received and it's being looked up for routing and if the route is uh, found, then it's sent over to the crossbar, and the crossbar is responsible for switching the packet over the router to the outgoing interface. And then you have the queuing, which is the, the time the packets need to wait in order to be processed. You have two queues, either at the incoming or at the outgoing. Normally, packets are queued uh, in the incoming interface, where it is uh, waiting for the, for the CPU, if it's process, process schedule, or if it's enough available buffer at the outgoing uh, interface. When it comes to the 
to the forwarding in the network. Packet forwarding is often assumed to be deterministic, and the only factor influencing the inter-packet times is queuing caused by cross-traffic. That is often assumed, and is often uh, taken as granted when you're doing measurements. This assumption is in contrast to our observation and caught our interest. Here you see our small pictures or two measurements we did. Is uh, we, it is the jitter and it's end-to-end -end delay. As you can see, we did two measurements, multicast and unicast. If you now look at the end-to-end -end delay, we see that it has some similarities to uniform distribution, which is normally not seen. A normal uh, traffic uh, observation is Pareto or log normal, or uh, de depending on the on the traffic, the traffic load. Also, when it comes to the jitter, we see it has a, is it is multimodal and is spaced by a constant time. This was something uh, interesting for us, and we didn't know exactly why this did happen. Earlier work has shown that well. If you look at this one, you can say that, well, this is the main bottleneck, while this is a second bottleneck, and the distance in time here is what is declares the bottleneck link capacity. But that was not, in, uh, that was not the case in our uh, situation, because we had 60 microseconds, and that should uh, should be a 200 megabits link, for instance. But we did not have any 200 megabits in our path. We had one gigabit and upwards. So this was a little bit strange and caught our interest. So back to the timers. Uh, yeah. Then if you look at the timers, you see that some are static while some are variable. And our figures, we saw that the, the end to the line, it was spread over a larger area. It was 200 microseconds. So it must be due to some, uh, some variables that is not static within the black boxes itself. So then we can remove the transmission time and the propagation de delay. Then we end up with the uh, variable timers. That is the processing time and queuing time. And it is not due to the queuing time, so it has to be due to the processing time. So if we now look at how the packets are actually forwarded within the routers themselves or the black boxes, there are two methods. It is uh, fast path or slow path. The fast path is, uh, is benefited from parallel processing. You have a cache lookup, that means a cache is already installed in the cache for this specific route. So when a packet arrives to the router, it just look up at the, in the cache and the packet is handed up to the crossbar and sent out to the to the resp to the to the outgoing interface. And the packet forwarding is done on interrupt level. When it comes to the process switching. A packet needs to wait. It has to wait for the central processor input queue until they are scheduled for processing. So the process switch packets are associated with a higher router delay or route delay. That is obvious. Today routers, they mainly fast switch the traffic applying dedicated hardware. However, process switching, which involves the router operating system, might occur occasionally before caching, caches in hardware modules are updated. Some routers are by design fast switching majority of the traffic, but some type of traffic <coughs> is by, by design uh, being process switched. For instance, IP version 6 are uh, is by some routers process switches. Long time ago, multicast was process switched. So if you start to look at the traffic and you try to measure traffic by Jitter, you will see that some traffic will be process switched while others will not be. 
or in case of internal router failures or misconfigures, a large portion of the traffic is process switched. So in our case, we set up a test bed. Uh, we send packets from source with an inter-packet gap of 10 milliseconds. And the packets were time-stamped at source by using Linux and by using Doug. Doug Codge. That means if, we, if the packets were equally forwarded within a router, we should not see any change in the traffic pattern at the destination comparing to the source. So that means we should see the same pattern at both sides. But if the packets or one packet is delayed due to queue or other timers within a router, it is obviously delayed and is added a delay. But in our, our case, since we are using 10 milliseconds difference or a 10 milliseconds interval in between the packets, the time being added to, to the time between, in this case, P1 and P2 will be reduced <coughs> for the next packet if not P3 is uh, changed. So that means if you now look at uh, the jitter, it will be mirrored around zero, not, necess not necessarily exact at uh, mirror, but it will be mirrored around zero. Our measurements, uh, the measurements were performed over UNINET, the Norwegian National Research and Education Network, which connect university, college, and research institutions to the internet. The UNINET core interconnects the main Norwegian cities with 110 and a two half, two and a half gigabit per second uh, links in a ring structure. The capacity on the access link to the institution varies for one gigabit and upwards. So if you now look at our, our measurement path, here is the equipment. Uh, it was not on the main uh, path within the UNINET, but uh, still there is some these equipments are used. Uh, the, the measurements were taken at the Linux and at DAG. That means those two measurements were not exactly uh, set at the same time. It is a Cisco box in between. So if you now go back to the end-to-end -end delay, we see that there is a difference between multicast and uh, unicast. Here is a packet gap, or a time gap, I mean. There is a gap in 50 microseconds delay. But what is more interesting is this uniform, or similar to uniform distribution. What causing this is, as I already said, it has to do with some internal uh, processing within the black box. So th this delay distribution has to be caused by, the, by <coughs> some, some timers within the routers. Yeah. We as we can see, it is multimodal. Uh, the distance between the, the modes are 60 microseconds. And after a closer look at the routers along the path, we saw that majority of the packets were uh, process switched and not fast switched. That means this mode is fast switched, this mode is process switched, and this mode is also process switched, but this uh, mode represents uh, when you are waiting in the queue being for, for being process switched. The distance between those modes are the time required for being process switched. And the width of this, uh, this mode is the cross traffic. The, the problem of having a, a router or a black box doing process switching is, of course, you queue, you queue up uh, packets. So if those packets 
are leaving a 10 gigabit link. And if they now receive a new link that is one gigabit, of course you will, you have a high, higher chance of experiencing packet loss. So the problem of, of having those routers is that the throughput goes down and you will probably see some packet loss later in the path. So back to this uh, topology. <laughs> when we saw that one router were doing process switching, it was replaced. And that was this Cisco box. It was the 10700, which was replaced with a Juniper MX80. And we did some measurements after the replacement, but now there was less process switch to traffic. And you can see in one direction, there is only fast switching. There is a small dip here. That means some packets are always being process switched. For instance, for Cisco, uh, 120 of the cache entry are removed or recycled every minute. In case of low memory, there is one fifth of the cache entries that is being recycled each, each minute. Uh, in the opposite side, you see there is there's a higher chance of being process switched for the multicast traffic than for the unicast. And this is most likely due to, to more logic or that the cache entry is more likely to be a change for a unicast entry. We did also do some uh, measurement for, well, as already explained, uh, we did also do some uh, measurement using Linux. And we did not see any difference between Linux and, uh, and DAG when it comes to Jitter. But that is mostly due to the amount of uh, observation. When the observation is large enough, those observation for uh, DAG and Linux will be equal or similar. <coughs> so there is no so that means it, the investment in high precision hardware for a GTR observation is unnecessarily if the number of observation is uh, high enough. So then the conclusion, the flow routers with suboptimal packet forwarding is inferred by applying commonly available measurements techniques and an analyze methods. Such, such flawed routers are not necessarily detected by ordinary network management routines since no alarms are generated, even though packets may be lost. Our multi-mode jitter observation turns out to reveal the difference between fast and process switched <coughs> packets. The main mode presents fast switched packets, while additional modes show the probability of being process switched. The time distance between the modes present processing time for process switching. And we did not see any difference between, between uh, Doug and Linux for the Jitter observation. That's it. Questions? Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? The first question would be, uh, oh, don't worry, it's the only question, uh, what kind of uh, packets were you using? Because that seems to make a large difference between whether it's done on the CPU or on the fabric usually. With UDP? Just UDP, okay. We use big UDP flows, and what we usually see is the first packet might actually go through the, uh, through the CPU because it needs to set up a hardware flow, and then the f packets after that get uh, routed in, uh, in hardware, and uh, you can actually have the second packet take, uh, arriving before the first packet even, if you have a high, high speed uh, data flow. So maybe you should also try this with a very high UDP rate. Yeah, but that, I mean, that is what is commonly known. I mean, the first packet is unknown for a router, so you need to install a cache entry for that one. Yeah. So. But if, of course, if you have a high-speed <coughs> traffic flow, then you will have your, 
for example. Yeah, and the other thing we've seen is routers doing bunching, that if you have a fairly high rate, but it is not exactly li line rate, then it will actually send out all the packets as a burst and then be quiet for a bit. And so, so it, it would be really interesting to do this at uh, higher line rates. And now that I've learned from your talk that you can do it with fairly simple means, I'm, I think I'm going to be trying some, of my, some more of this myself as well. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Great. Any other question? Oh, this is yes. Hi, this is Noor from Dante. I have a question. While these tests were performed, did you consider class of services features like priority of the queue or bufferings, all those features? Any no. impact? Well, sorry? An impact of these class of services features? No, we didn't. Well. No, we did not uh, consider th this okay. one. Okay, thank you. But I guess it wouldn't matter. I mean, you could have a different class when it comes to if if you're talking about quality service, for instance, or if th the class is uh, <coughs> type of application or traffic type. But I, I guess it wouldn't make any difference to the result. Maybe the queue, priority of the queue, it might, and yeah. the buffering. Yeah, but impact but the, the processing time internal to the switch or the router. Yeah, but the thing is, the packet is either handed to the for process uh, switching or it's not. Mm, yeah. I think it's processed by hardware. That, that, that is the thing. Is Majority of the packets, well, a common understanding is that majority of the packets are, are fast switched, but some are not. And as we have an example here, the first packet in a flow is always uh, process switched, but the remaining packets are process switched in case or unless the switch or the router is misbehaved, as in our case. But if you have a, a queue that has some priority, it wouldn't make any difference since the problem is that the, the packets are not being uh, fast switched. So I, I don't see, but uh, it could be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh. My name is Jürgen Weiss. I'm, I'm wondering a bit about uh, the, the, the cache uh, uh, explanation. B b b actually, uh, current Cisco hardware and uh, Juniper as well, uh, at least for the last 10 years, uh, Cisco has a Cisco Express forwarding, which uh, loads all the uh, routing table and, and into the hardware, so there should be no cache effect at all. It should be. But according to our logs, within the router itself, it says that a lot of packets, well, majority of the packets going through this router is process switched. Uh, have you, you, you talked to, to Cisco about it? Because uh, it, it's, uh, at least as uh, the, the vendors advertised, uh, it, this should happen. Yeah, but, I, well, th but this is not a general problem for Cisco routers. It's more specific for one type of router and for one specific type of traffic for one type of router. So it's just a small problem. It's not a general problem. <coughs> um, I'll tell you one more from uh, Dante. Um, you say that the, uh, the suboptimal uh, for uh, packet forwarding uh, that you can request meant that more packets, many more packets were processed switch than fast switch as you've been expecting, and, and this is what you saw in your graphs. And then you, in that uh, concluding paragraph, the first one, you're going to say that um, uh, packets may be lost. So I, I can see that a process switch packet might be delayed and uh, arrive out of order, um, but, but, but lost, it, was that the case? And if so, do you know why they were lost as opposed to just misordered? Well, if if you, you buffer up a large amount of traffic within the, the, the router that is uh, processed or 
process switching the traffic. And this huge amount of traffic lives on this router on a 10 gigabits line card and then is being arrived on another router that has a slower interface and you have more line cards coming in then hypothetically it, you will have some loss well the probability increase oh right okay so um bursty traffic and then flying buffers yeah you will okay. increase bursty traffic yeah right okay yeah. thanks any other questions Okay, thank you very much, Lars. <laughs> Our next presenter, she's Trupti Kulkarni from Dante. She's a senior software engineer, and Trupti is behind many projects in the Giant network, including uh, hardware inventory and monitoring. And she's going to present the latest project which is called Siemen, and it has to do with something revolutionary, and it is uh, multi-domain circuit monitoring. Uh, so it's monitoring <coughs> on the data plane of circuits, which are mainly created via the bandwidth on demand service. Yes, this presentation um, concentrates on that, but it can have other yeah. use cases as well. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Trupti Kulkarni, I'm from Dante, and I welcome you all to this presentation about CMON, which is short for Circuit Monitoring, a multi-domain end-to-end circuit monitoring tool that we're developing in Géant. This particular presentation is about how CMON uses the measurement federation uh, software PerfSonar to achieve this monitoring. Now, since the uh, TNC started on Monday, I have attended a number of sessions, and all the presentations have been very informative, very engaging, and I hope that this presentation also is equally interesting to you all. So, moving on, let's take... Um, let's take a look at the agenda, what lies ahead of us in this presentation. Um, I'll start with an introduction, so a setting a scene um, sort of slide. Then we'll move on to motivation, why do we need to monitor, what we are dealing with in terms of monitoring. We'll look at CMON as a solution to multi-domain monitoring, dig a little bit deeper and go into um, the different systems that CMON works with, look at its architecture, design, information, workflow, current status of CMON, and then finally wrap up with the conclusion. So um, when I started putting up the slide for introduction, I wanted to write about what we are dealing with in the network in terms of services, in terms of users, and one slide is not enough, but let me try to put it in perspective as much as I can. Um, resources today are often distributed. They are big. And these resources are users, like big science users, different scientific projects like AutoKNF, radio astronomy, genome science. And the data that's exchanged in these scientific and research projects is also a lot. And the services and applications that aid such research projects are federated. They are multi-domain. Projects these days are, um, they span different countries, they span different universities, even continents. And they all feed into global research demands in terms of both infrastructure as well as connections. Infrastructure is expected to be reliable, robust, secure. Connections are expected to be on demand, dedicated, high bandwidth, less jitter. So the result is bigger networks in terms of technology, size, and geographical locations. So having seen why, um, how big the network scene is, the services and the applications that provide these services for different research projects, let's look at why do we have to monitor them and how can we monitor them. Now, every time I think about the word monitor and I come across that word, I am reminded of this um, 
memory that I'd like to share with you from my childhood. I grew up and I, I studied in India. And in my school, we used to have um, monitors in each class. Each class had about 60 students. And um, because the school was really big, sometimes it used to take time for teachers to come from the staff room to individual classes. And students being students, we used to create ruckus in the class. So we had monitors in each class who used to ensure that there was order in the class, there was no disruption in the class. So if we extrapolate that to today's network and services situation, we can see that research collaborations today require um, dedicated high-speed network connections to collaborate and facilitate research between collaborating partners. A lot of data is exchanged, and to manage this data, uh, you require dedicated links. Managing such links, which often traverse multiple domains with heterogeneous technologies, uh, poses a compelling research challenge in terms of how to monitor them, how to ensure that these links are always up, they provide the best bandwidth what the users have requested for, and it's not just enough to provide a service or to be able to provision a service, it's also very important to monitor so you give the best of service to your users. So it's important to monitor the performance, the usage of the service, in order to provide high bandwidth, <coughs> less jitter, to facilitate research, to facilitate development and adoption of more services, <coughs> and for easy troubleshooting. In a multi-domain scenario, troubleshooting is quite important because if there is a problem in any, any of the segments in a circuit that, that is an end-to-end -end circuit, then it should be easily um, it should be easy to spot where exactly is the problem and how do we get to that and how do we quickly resolve it and get the service back up again and performing to its maximum capacity again. <coughs> For that, we provide CMON as an answer. So what does CMON do and what are <coughs> its features. Um, it's a unified platform for circuit monitoring. It provides both circuit availability and performance metrics. It is technology agnostic in terms of how the circuit is provisioned and also the network uh, that's providing the service, this, the end-to-end -end circuit. It uses different methods for monitoring ranging from SNMP to an interface to a network's own um, network management system. And it also interfaces with perf sonar for performance measurements. It does both active and passive measurements. For active measurements, it employs perf uh, sonar services for measurement metrics such as latency, errors. And passive measurements are achieved through SNMP or proxy to a network's own um, NMS. So the aim is to make the tool easy to use flexible and aid better research and better network quality. So what you see here are the features of CMON. Now whenever you talk about a new tool to do something to provide a new service, the first questions users need to know is, it's great that you have these features, but what are these features translating into? What kind of benefits? The question they ask is, what's in it for me? So it's very important that the features translate into benefits for the easy adoption of the tools. So who is it targeted to? It's targeted towards the NREN NOCs, multi-domain service desks, to support end users and researchers and aid better collaboration between them. For proactive identification of problems, the raison d'etre of um, monitoring system should be proactive monitoring, not reactive monitoring. The monitoring system should quickly identify a bottleneck as and when it is occurring and take steps to ensure that you identify the source of the problem and ensure that it doesn't happen again. So CMON aids in that. It gives a complete view of monitoring data in each domain for easy troubleshooting and diagnosis, which leads to better network performance for distributed project partners. Let's take a look at the systems that Simon works with. BOD is bandwidth on demand service, which is an um, on demand service that is used to provide high speed end to end connectivity between two endpoints that 
uh, can span different domains. It can use different technologies. The tool that is used to provide this service within Jayant is called Autobahn, Automatic Bandwidth Allocation Across Heterogeneous Network. The diagram here is its architecture diagram. Uh, the user uses the central web GUI instance to request such a circuit. He can also specify parameters such as where the circuit will start from, the ending domain, uh, duration, what, what time the circuit will um, begin carrying traffic. Uh, this request is passed down to individual IDMs, inter-domain managers, which pass down that information to domain managers that have topology information. And this request is passed down again to a helper module called Technology Proxy, which has access to the domain's network resources to actually make this reservation. The second component here is Jayant Perf Sonar. In, in Perf Sonar, we have different measurement points and measurement archives in each domain. They carry out automated and scheduled tests to gather certain performance metrics and store them in measurement archive. Each of these components is registered in a home lookup service, and the global lookup service is a registry of all the components registered with the home lookup service, and it also has a central GUI in order to see all these metrics that are collected. So how does CMON work with a circuit provisioning system like Autobahn and a measurement federation like PerfSonar? The diagram here, the components in green are CMON, um, mo CMON modules. The components in blue are provisioning function modules. And the ones in yellow are monitoring functions. <coughs> to explain it in a nutshell, CMON gets circuit request as soon as the request is successful from a circuit provisioning system to into a CMON um, module called CMON headquarters, which has interface server. It interfaces, it uses that information and then collects it and passes it to the home lookup service, and which gets the um, address of distributed CMON agents so that they can start collecting monitoring data. So as you can see, there is a central GUI, CMON monitoring manager, CMON um, interface function. CMON agents are distributed components that are deployed in each domain. In the multi-domain environment, it's very important that you maintain uniqueness of names. Hence, CMON conforms to UR and glyph naming format for circuit IDs and segment IDs. To see, uh, to dig a little bit deeper into CMON's information workflow, uh, there are three phases. The first phase is circuit notification phase. It starts off when a user uses the, I'm sorry. <laughs> when a user uses the circuit provisioning system and requests a circuit, it continues through to the time until when the circuit is actually ready to carry traffic. When the circuit is thus established, the provisioning agent, IDM, in terms of Autobahn, sends a CRM, circuit request message, to the headquarters interface function. This um, CRM contains circuit and segment descriptors which give information about what domains are passing through for this circuit, looking at which the CMON's uh, monitoring manager contacts each of the agents so that they can start collecting monitoring data once the circuit is ready. That brings us to our circuit monitoring phase, the second phase. This starts when the circuit is actually ready and uh, ready to carry traffic. Agents at that point start collecting monitoring data in each domain by contacting the um, measurement archives in each, of, uh, in each of their domains. This data is then sent securely back to headquarters monitoring manager, which does intelligent aggregation of this information, stores it in database from where the CMON GUI can retrieve and display it. When the circuit um, ends, either manually or automatically, the provisioning agent once again sends a CTM, a circuit termination message to headquarters interface server, so that when um, the headquarters gets this message, it informs each of the agents that it should stop collecting monitoring data. 
It sends an end command to each agent. <coughs> so the current status of CMON is that we developed a flavor of it called CMON S, um, a multi-domain monitoring circuit for end-to-end -end static circuits, which was demonstrated during the annual GN3 Plus Symposium in Vienna last year. It had its own standalone GUI, and the map on the right shows the topology information, the topology diagram that was used for this demonstration. Distributed agents in each domain collected data, transferred it securely to the headquarters, and the GUI displayed them. Following that, we developed, uh, currently developing a version of CMON called CMON-D to monitor dynamic circuits that are set up by Autobahn. This is in development and will soon be launched as a pilot with three entrants who are also using BOD service. So to conclude, CMON addresses the gap in multi-domain circuit monitoring. It, it provides both circuit availability information and performance metrics of a circuit. It adds to the wide variety of um, personal suite of functions that are already available, and it leads to better performance and happy users. Future plans are to develop a more intuitive GUI. Uh, develop an alarming capability, probably um, interface it with a trouble ticketing system, have multiple agents which can um, use different methods to collect monitoring data as in not only rely on personal but also have other methods, um, simplify deployment of agents as with minimal or no configuration, in use other uh, monitoring methods and create a framework and standardize it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tripti. Any questions? Well, I may have one. Okay. Uh, have you looked at the possibility of uh, Simon interoperating with uh, the MDVPN service and how this could happen? Uh, yes, Simon um, has recognized MDVPN as one of its use cases, and okay. MDVPN is also in pilot, so we are definitely looking into that. We don't just want Simon to be limited to circuits, we want it to be extendable to other use cases as well. So, yes. Great. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, as was discussed in some of the previous sessions, uh, Internet2 and ESNet Indiana are working with Jayant in terms of figuring out how to move Persona forward. Um, I think it would be very useful to uh, continue the conversation in terms of what requirements you might like to see out of Persona to make sure that we're working together. Uh, sure, that'd yes, be, that'd thank be you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Tripti. Um, I think you mentioned that um, Simon S uh, was able to handle both um, uh, manually uh, configured circuits and um, uh, uh, circuits created by systems. I, I think that's what I uh, heard you say. Um, but uh, presumably, that has to be. S you also mentioned that uh, a provisioning agent would have to report this back to um, HQIF. In case of Simon, in, in the case of dynamic circuits. Right, okay, so that, that's just for the dynamic circuit. Uh, yes, so that's right. This is just for, this, this diagram here was just about how CMON interfaces with a dynamic circuit provisioning system like Autobahn and uses measurement federation like Persona to do monitoring. Right, thanks so much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Trupti. Thank you all. Our uh, next speaker is Fausto Vetter. He's from uh, RMP. He's an R&D uh, coordinator there, and he's going to present uh, a personal-based service, which is called MonIP. Uh, Fausto, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, so, as uh, I was presented, my name is Fausto Vettel, and I came here to present the current uh, developments we are doing in Brazil 
uh, in terms of performance monitoring service. And um, basically, um, IMP history and management activities uh, comes from 2002 when we started a few uh, working groups. Uh, the two first working groups are focused on the quality of service uh, and uh, passive monitoring and active monitoring initially. Uh, f the the up to 2007, we've done some uh, other working groups uh, that were looking into more measurement and we've done the first um, prototype versions of our services. Uh, at this point, uh, we started doing some um, um, initial uh, international interactions. Uh, I myself, uh, at that point, I was working at the University, uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina, and then I participated in a personal developers meeting in 2006, and then afterwards we, we hosted also a developers meeting in 2007. Uh, the first developments then in Brazil uh, were f a few PISBI, and SLA, CLMP, ICE, and Cactus Sonar. PISBI was a prototype infrastructure that came to be our service nowadays. Uh, NSLA is a, a software that enables uh, the user to uh, monitor ser service level agreements. And we've done other components for like a command line measurement point and uh, some user interface based on Cacti as well. Uh, this enabled us to, to uh, in the further projects, to go into an experimental service that was run between 2008 and 2007. Uh, to follow up this uh, service, we've done also some developments in terms of implementing the uh, NMWG uh, infrastructure and PHP that's uh, still the base of our service. We've uh, we also developed more our tools. Uh, we've done a reporting tool as well, and we've done a measurement archive for Professor. For those of you that are not familiar with the components of Professor, uh, Persona has the measurement points that are installed in the customer sites, and then you have some archives that can hold information, share with the the use, uh, share the data uh, across multiple domains. We also, at that point, deployed a lookup service and a few other performance tools that we were ena en enabled for our customers. The NDT, the Network Diagnostic Tester, was focusing most on the uh, end users and also some passive uh, tools based on net netflow. Uh, after that, then uh, we moved to a production service between 2010 and 2012. Uh, the, and then uh, we deployed the node pops to basically two servers and a GPS antenna. Uh, as you can see, our network is quite big. It goes across all the capital states, and from those capital states, we have points of presence that uh, manage the network connectivity for our customers. One of the big challenges in, uh, we wanted to overcome because has it, the service initially was really focused on the backbone, and it was a li little bit problematic to reach uh, the customers because it would be there are a few challenges. Uh, since I joined IMP in the R&D uh, department, then uh, we changed a little bit of uh, the focus of this service uh, towards our, our, we wanted to reach our clients. And the objective is to enable performance measurement and provide the data of the backbone and also to enable uh, measurements from the backbone to other endpoints. Uh, so, so from 2013 to, to up to now, we're building uh, different components that will allow us to um, deploy the persona in a different uh, way in our customers. Um, so the basic uh, strategies to uh, keep uh, the focus on our clients is that we wanted to lower the hardware cost because if you need two servers to deploy persona, it, it might be costly because IMP nowadays, uh, we have about 1,000 uh, universities connecting to, to the to the backbone, and it can be costly for the university to, de to deploy two servers just for um, performance uh, monitoring. And, in, and also, we wanted to simplify the, the infrastructure deployment, uh, because if you need an expensive GPS antenna for, um, uh, for monitoring uh, one-way delay, it can be something, something hard for a university to deploy, a very small university, and also, 
we wanted to improve the user experience of the service because we had a lot of uh, different components that were not integrated. Um, uh, we wanted to make it easier for the user to use this infrastructure. So uh, we came up with the, the first strategy was to, to load the cost. We, we came up with a few strategies. Now we are uh, running a persona of it. Uh, we want to run Persona in virtual machines. We already done some tests, and it's working pretty well. We've overcome the problem with the GPS, so we, we managed to get synchronization for the, the, the clock synchronization in the virtual environment. Also, we came with the concept of a low-cost measurement kit that's basically, uh, uh, for the moment, we, uh, we're using Raspberry Pi for latency measurement uh, points, mainly because it has a serial port where we can connect the GPS antenna and then we can get uh, synchronization, synchronize the clock. We're also using a low GPS antenna, low cost GPS antenna from other fruit. That um, the main reason to choosing this antenna is because it allowed us to use the PPS sign signal and it allows us to uh, synchronize the clock quite precisely. Uh, PPS is pulse per second, uh, just to to explain, and also uh, we, ch we chose Qbox uh, for achievable bandwidth MP because it had a one gigabit interface. Even though it doesn't uh, reach one, gig one gigabit consistently, it's a quite good hardware for, for, for our purpose and considering the cost, it was a good alternative for us. Uh, also, we are also developing a measurement point that reaches 10 gigabit, but is, is still under development. And we're currently developing a new web-based graphical interface uh, that allows us to execute and display measurement results and also to configure and control all the measurement point. The concept of this new user interface is to be able to seamless uh, uh, navigate between these portals. So one of the features that we came up is that the portal has this look and basically you can navigate using these uh, other portals and then you can navigate through portals uh, and you, you, will, you won't notice that you're changing from one environment to another one. And basically, this will be deployed like a, a web base uh, main portal, and then you can go to a pop, and then you can go to a customer, and then you can navigate back to this portal. Has it would be like a, a single portal. Uh, also, you can run on demand tests. Basically, you, if you want to do some troubleshooting on the network, you can run the test, save the results, and then you can share these results with the other user. It's quite interesting for cases where you have uh, prob problematic links, someone is complaining, and then you can uh, investigate it better. Uh, you also can retrieve this on the test uh, after, some, after you, you run this test, and also you you can uh, schedule measurements on this infrastructure, so you can get some kind of, um, you can uh, be more proactive and look at these measurements in, in, um, in a regular fashion. Uh, the money pay service is, also is compatible with uh, uh, Persona PS and MDM. Now they, uh, it was just announced here that they, they will be uh, join it forward again, but before uh, when I submitted this, this was the scenario that I had. Professional PS is an Internet to an ESNET, uh, ESNET initiative, and the MDM was the GM initiative. So we created some measurement scenarios that we wanted to, to evaluate, and we, we wanted to we want to measure it for international scenarios that's between engines and the backbone that's between the pop among the pops we have and the institutional scenario basically is to measure uh, from the nearest spot towards the customer and we created some uh, scheduling mechanisms like you can uh, run on demand tests periodic t um, scheduling and permanent tests periodic scheduling is basically if you have an event then you want to run to schedule like for a week and then this is just for some time then the user can go to the interface and and se select the period and and for the permanent ones is that you want just regular measurements and then you just move it up to a long time you can schedule point to point point to multi point and multi point to multi point that's basically a matrix scenario 
Uh, the metrics that uh, we are offering in the service is pack mainly packet loss, one way delay, the one trip time, uh, the ba actual bandwidth in TCP, and the UDP bandwidth. Uh, basically, for uh, as an architecture, we are saying that for the international scenario, we'll be using 10 gigabit m measurement points. In the backbone, there will be a mix of virtual box, virtual servers, and uh, for up to one gigabit. And then uh, we want to install later 10 gigabit boxes whenever, whenever we find it useful. And the clients will be installing the uh, low cost kit that I've presented to, to you. Uh, I also compare this service with the Web Atlas. Uh, Web Atlas proposed itself to be an internet measurement network uh, with, that's based on the idea of probes, and it focuses on internet connectivity and reachability. It, is ba it provides the user the ability to do active measurements at baseline, and uh, it also enables on-demand measurements, and it wants to produce uh, different um, traffic maps, and allow the community to use uh, the data to do, do other analysis, and it wants to be a trusted source of uh, real data active management for, for the internet. Uh, it uses different concepts uh, uh, to build infrastructure. It's user, the idea of user, that's basically anyone uh, accessing the, port, the infrastructure. The host is basically the, the, the boxes or, or the institution, and the sponsor would be like uh, uh, anyone or uh, institution that puts some money and deploy a lot of boxes and uh, enable this infrastructure for the, for the users. It is based on the idea of an anchor and a probe. The anchor is basically a better node that's installed in a, in a more uh, secure way, and it's, it's used to, to, to benchmark, and the probe is the device that's installed in, uh, in the use end user and is used to, to schedule the measurements. So uh, the metrics that WIPE uh, focus is basically conf the configuration of the network, the probe uptime, uh, run trip time, uh, some pin trace route and SL cell queries and also DNS. Uh, the, the main difference between the services, uh, they use pretty much similar uh, infrastructure in terms of hardware, but the main difference is that the main IP service is focusing on the performance management, while the uh, WIPE Atlas is more about uh, active management, and it doesn't allow you to run uh, bandwidth uh, tests. And um, it is not. It, it doesn't allow you also ha as well to do uh, precise uh, delay measurements. Uh, as um, as we are doing the MNP service. So the service infrastructure uh, in the IMP level, we are using two virtual servers: one to host the measurement portal for the end user, and another measurement archive that uh, will host the holds the data for the pops, the, the measurement between amongst pops, and also uh, we install in each pop uh, uh, two virtual servers, one for measurement archive and the measurement point uh, to, to enable the measurement uh, up to the uh, client side. We will be using GPS antennas that we will be using in perf uh, the MonoIP service for uh, previous projects, and we will have two dedicated NICs uh, for delay and throughput. Uh, and the client side will send a uh, one gigabit um, cube box, the Raspberry Pi, and the GPS antenna. Um, we've done a pilot last year, and it was run in four uh, clients, and using two pops as reference. In the pops, we deploy this pop measurement point and the other infrastructure required, and for we send this uh, equipment, uh, the low-cost co low kits for the institution. We didn't test the 10 gigabit uh, port, uh, 10 gigabit measurement point, and we, if you want, uh, the, uh, the pilot is still running, then you can access this through the portal.mnp.rmp.bi, and then you can use the guest account uh, uh, with the guest password, then you can uh, see the uh, measurements that we're still running uh, between uh, the in, the in this pilot. Uh, the participants of the pilot were uh, our pop in Minas Gerais, that's pop MG, it's connected up to 10 gigabits per second. Uh, 
This is a uh, Manila wire. It's connected at, at eight megabits per second, and it's a, it's a satellite link. It was selected by the engineering team of the IMP, given some um, pro, uh, the being a satellite link. It's a it's a more uh, interesting use case for for performance um, monitoring. Uh, also, the Federal University of Visosa that's connected to up to 310 megabits per second. Um, the pops in Santa Catarina that's uh, also connected up to 10 gigabits per second. Uh, a laboratory of in the Federal University of Santa Catarina that's connected up to 10 megabits per second. And a co uh, countryside connection connected to the pop of Santa Catarina pop in Videira that's connected up to 4 megabits per second. Uh, the time frame that we ran the pilot officially was between October and December, and uh, we, we started his, with a kickoff meeting, and uh, the idea was to evaluate the deployment of this infrastructure, uh, to run some permanent tests amongst POPs and between, uh, and the, between the POP and the directly connected site, basically to validate the scenarios that we, we proposed to the service. And, uh, and to allow the user to run on demand tests has required. After that, then the, we sent uh, we sent the equipment to the customers and uh, to the client institutions to so they could physically install the uh, infrastructure in their premises. Uh, the pilot infrastructure uh, uh, that was installed, as you can see, we sent to the pops. For the moment, we sent for the pilot. We actually sent proper servers, but. Uh, they are running a virtual environment, and uh, in each of the uh, customers, we, s we sent the, the low-cost kit, and we, we requested them to install it closer to the router, so we could uh, test uh, the backbone scenario, the customer side scenario has presented before, and then allow on the one test among those customers. Uh, at the point, I'm showing now uh, some pictures of the deployment with them. This is the GPS antenna that we installed. As you can see, it's a quite easy antenna to install. You, you have some, you just glue in, the, in, in a wall outside and uh, it works quite fine. We've been using this antenna in a few demonstrations that we've been doing in, uh, in IMP workshops. And it takes like a couple hours and, and then install the infrastructure. Uh, this is the uh, cube box with the SSDs as well and the Raspberry Pi. And this is the Raspberry Pi installed uh, in, in the box. And this is the um, cube box in closer view. So we, we had some criteria. Uh, we wanted to the evaluate the deployment. We wanted to uh, ensure that we would fulfill the scenarios we propose and that the schedule management would work and ensure that we could have proper clock synchronization. Uh, they were, uh, we didn't have time to fine tune the performance, but we, because we were fi uh, focusing on the, on the back fixing of the code. Well, basically, we managed to deploy his plan. Uh, given the short time, uh, the results are very preliminary, but uh, even though uh, we think uh, the results are considered appropriate for the purpose of what we wanted to achieve, and the scenarios, uh, well, the scenarios that we managed to validate were the backbone and the client side. So we had some problems. We had some uh, transport problems uh, because of these boxes are quite fragile. We had some memory issues uh, because we are using SSD uh, memory. Uh, we had some bug fixing that uh, was causing it. This is more detailed in the paper. Um, these are some uh, measurement results. This is to, to the video side. And it's from the pop to the video, and then video to, to the pop. And as you can see, we managed to achieve quite good performance with the boxes. Uh, this is uh, up to the Federal University of Visosa. It's the same. Uh, we think uh, the boxes work it quite well for, for those links. Uh, this is to the manual, uh, the satellite link, as you can see, is quite unstable. And it was a really good use case for this uh, service. Um, this is one way delay. Um, and this is the uh, run track trip time for that uh, satellite link. As you can see, it's quite a, a 
length path is about 500 milliseconds uh, for, for this link. So uh, lessons learned, we need to properly package things, we, we need to investigate uh, the data loss, we need to monitor this infrastructure to ensure that the service <laughs> operates properly. We, um, we need to, even though we had some issues during, we consider the, these quite interesting results for, for, for the pilot. And uh, the, the problems that we saw in the pilot, they are quite close to real world environments. Uh, users thought that the services were quite relevant and they were interested most in, TCP, in the TCP to bandwidth metric and the management, uh, they considered the most important for the moment up to now, the on-demand management, but they, we think it's because they are not used to, to monitor the, these metrics uh, frequent, frequently. Um, the new features that we, they, they requested are basically scheduling among client sites, uh, transfer tool, uh, link availability management, and co SNMP counters. Uh, they gave us a lot of other imp uh, inputs for, for improving the deployment process, the service experience, and the usage of the service, and how the uh, other general commands itself. Uh, we, we are working now on, uh, to improve the management portal. We want to uh, support trace route and the entity uh, in this interface. And uh, we are working also on, on a new low-cost management point that will be based on the single hardware for measuring the both, ma instead of having two separate hardware, just one hardware to measure uh, both metrics that we want to virtualize this uh, and deploy, virtualize the whole uh, backbone uh, in the props. And we must also deploy some 10 gigabit uh, measurement points and also to spread these low cost measurement kits to attend some uh, use case in throughout the users. So, this is the team that's in the project. Uh, and I think, thank you. Thank you very much. That was quite interesting. Any questions? Oh. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Neil O'Reilly, UCD. Uh, it seems that your measurement requirements are a little different from what the RIPE Atlas uh, system can do but uh, I hope you're keeping in touch with them because it seems that there's a lot of opportunity for supporting each other's work and you might find that interesting. Okay, thank you. There are RIPE NCC people here, you know about that. Sir? The RIPE NCC people are here. Oh, okay. They have a stand in the, in the lunch area. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, hi. Um, which devices was it that you tried uh, as virtual machines again, and um, did you uh, experience any issues with them being on virtual machines as opposed to onto physical hardware? No, well, actually, uh, we tried uh, our service machines that are deployed in the in the in the pops. Uh, the main issue for us was the virtual the virtual environment that we're using uh, with the VMware Five. You can actually reach, uh, because we have a GPS antenna in all, all pops, if, if you can uh, reach uh, the GPS antenna through the virtual, virtual environment, then you can have good clock synchronization then uh, for uh, measurement is enough. From, uh, from the VMware 5, now you can use the GPS signal from the GPS, then you probably ha you, we had good results for, the, for those. Well, uh, and a question for me. As a web developer, I always ask, do you release this project as an open source code project? Can we find the source codes? For the moment, uh, we're still we're planning to do that. I think I, um, it's up. Uh, we think it will, be, it will be open source, but we haven't defined yet. OK. We, we need to define the license and the IP and things like that before, before we release this to the public. 
Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Sure.